Tonight, UBC is delighted to host this important discussion to help inform your decision for this provincial election. Enjoy the debate. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And on or before October 24th, please remember to vote. An extraordinary time. Scary, nerve-wracking. Now we need a lot more compassion. Health. I mean, the health of the public. It's hard for me to find a job right now. How are we going to move forward? A short season of promises. Quality, accessible health care. To remove provincial sales tax completely for a year. Plans. Affordable housing. We're building it with a long-term view. And pushback. Mr. Wilkinson wants to stand and uh, yell and scream and jump up and down. John Horgan called an unnecessary election. We are ready to put an alternative in front of British Columbians. Now, together face to face to help you decide the 2020 BC Leaders Debate. Good evening, BC. We're coming to you from the Chan Center at the University of British Columbia for the only televised leaders debate of 2020. My name is Shachi Curl, and I will be your moderator for the next 90 minutes. With me, the leaders of our major political parties, Andrew Wilkinson of the BC Liberals, Sonia Furstenau of the Greens, and John Horgan of the NDP. Welcome. We thank UBC for its support in holding our debate here. Now, we are observing some strict COVID-19 protocols this evening. The leaders and I are physically distanced. There will be no handshakes at the end. And that's because this is anything but a traditional election campaign. There are estimates that almost half of the BC electorate could vote by mail. We hope our debate is a critical opportunity for you to assess the leaders and their party platforms. The leaders tonight have agreed to tonight's format and rules of order. Let me say, these are not suggestions, these are not guidelines, they are rules and we will enforce them with a countdown clock visible to all leaders. Our debate format and main themes have been determined by the broadcast consortium which represents BC's major broadcasters. Leaders will answer questions developed by the province's top political journalists and observers. These questions have not been shared in advance, though the leaders are aware of the general themes. You'll also see the leaders debate one-on-one -on -one in segments in which they've chosen to question each other on one of our themes. There will be plenty of opportunity for free two-way debate. Of the main themes, pandemic recovery will cover the economy, health, and long-term care. Cost of living will contain questions on housing, child care, and transit. Environment, resource policy, and climate targets will be next, followed by social issues, racism and inclusion, homelessness, and the opioid crisis. Now, to the leaders, a personal appeal. I know your strategists and your supporters want you to win tonight. We want the real winners to be the voters of BC. And we know you can achieve this with a respectful debate that everyone can hear and understand. Please answer the questions you're asked. I don't want to interrupt you, but I will if I have to. And with that, it's time to debate. The leader's speaking order was decided by a draw. The first question on pandemic recovery goes to Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson. Mr. Wilkinson, you've called this election unnecessary, but if now is not the time for a vote because we're in a pandemic, why is it the time for a change in government? You have one minute. Thank you, Sachi, and thank you to everybody who's watching tonight. British Columbia desperately needs a plan to lay out our economic future. We heard today from a major accounting firm that half of British Columbia households expect someone to lose their job this year. Another third can't pay their bills. So British Columbia needs a plan. And we believe that the livelihoods of British Columbians are at stake. We have to come up with that plan for the future. And the BC Liberal Party has a plan, a comprehensive plan that it starts with getting rid of the provincial sales tax for a full year and then reducing to 3% the second year, providing a bridging finance program for our tourism and hospitality industries, 
and also making sure that small businesses can survive because this is going to be a tough winter and we've got to hang together and make sure that British Columbians can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's going to be tough, but we can do it together. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Your next question. You've promised to scrap the PST for a year and bring it back at 3% until, in your words, the economy recovers. That is projected to be a $10 billion bite out of provincial coffers. How are you going to make up the lost revenue? We've been very clear saying that this economy is like a wartime economy. We have to invest in British Columbians. It's time to accept there are going to be deficits all around the Western world and we've got to take the chance to borrow money at very low interest rates, which governments can do, to invest in our people, to make sure that they can survive economically for the next year or so. We need to make sure that COVID vaccine becomes available as soon as possible, and we expect there'll be deficits, but we can get back to a balanced budget within about five years of the vaccine becoming available. This is the time to invest in ourselves, invest in our people, and make sure that British Columbians can look forward to prosperity in the future. It's not going to be easy, but when we work together, we can really make British Columbia a wonderful place. There are five million of us here, and we have enough skills, enough abilities, and the resources behind us to make sure that British Columbia prospers into the future. Once we get through COVID, we're going to have a lot of work to do, but we will succeed when we do it together. First question to you, Mr. Horgan. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, Mr. Horgan, your governing partners, the Greens, had said that your government was stable, and yet you called this snap election. At a time when British Columbians need their political leaders to be focused on governing, you are campaigning. You also broke your agreement on fixed election dates. Why should voters trust you again? You have one minute. Oh, well, thank you, Sachi, for the question. I also want to acknowledge we're on the territory of the Musqueam peoples, and I'm delighted to be here at UBC this evening. I grappled with the decision to call an election. I looked at the challenges that we're facing as British Columbians. We're in a pandemic. We will be in a pandemic next spring and likely next fall and beyond. I looked at the challenges British Columbians were facing. Our worlds have been turned upside down. And I think the best course of action is to put the politics and the election behind us and focus on the needs of British Columbians. We have worked collaboratively, the Green Party and, and my caucus, to do a whole bunch of very extraordinary things in a short period of time. But it's been three and a half years since British Columbians had their say. And I believe as we're going into the recovery phase and making sure that everyone's safe, we should ask British Columbians what they think and where they want to go. I believe it's the right time to do that so we can all be focused on British Columbians after October 26th or 24th. Mr. Horgan, your next question. We have been, as you mentioned, in a pandemic for seven months, but you did not share the details of your $1.5 billion economic recovery plan with British Columbians until days before calling this election. Why did you wait? Well, we wanted to get it right. Uh, we put in place an economic recovery task force that involved labor, large businesses, small businesses, indigenous groups, not-for-profits, and a whole host of others to ask them what they felt was the highest priority for the BC government. And then we asked British Columbians what they want to see from their leaders. Do they want us to invest in health care? Do they want us to make sure that we're bridging some businesses that were struggling, like tourism? And it took some time to get the views of the people that matter most in British Columbia, the people of BC. And then we passed every single piece of uh, money through the legislature together and then had Treasury Board confirm that this was an appropriate expenditure of BC resources. Six billion dollars between budgets is quite extraordinary. It's never happened before in living memory. I think we did it right. We got the right balance. And once the money was in place and started to go out the door to businesses, to communities and to individuals, I felt it was time to ask BC where they wanted to go and who they wanted to lead them. Thank you. Ms. First to know your first question. BC's economic recovery is in part driven by large fossil fuel projects such as LNG and Trans Mountain, projects that many of your supporters oppose. In a governing coalition with either of the other parties, will you support these projects to protect the jobs that they provide? Thank you, Sarchi, and I also want to acknowledge we are in Musqueam territory tonight. I'm delighted to be here, uh, and I will say this. We have to invest now into the future that we want. If we are propping up a dying fossil fuel industry with taxpayer money, what we're going to get are more emergencies down the road. We were choking 
on the fires, on the smoke from the fires from Western United States for weeks on end. There is no doubt that we are in a climate emergency right now. And the last thing that we need from governments is to be doubling down on investing and propping up and subsidizing to the tune of $6 billion this industry that puts our future, our lands, our children at peril. And I say that we can put that money, we can invest into a clean energy future that will create jobs and opportunities in every part of this province. Your next question, Ms. Fristino. Your party platform calls for an unprecedented transformation to a carbon neutral economy in 25 years. Now that is a massive change and you're calling for the work to begin immediately. There are so many BC sectors, including small business and tourism, that are struggling to survive a pandemic right now. Is right now the right time for this work to begin? You have a minute. Thank you. Right now is the time for us to be supporting those small businesses, to be getting the grant money out to the tourism operators who are wondering if they're going to make it through this winter. Right now, we should be doing that, not standing on this stage, not in an election campaign. But we also have to be aware that every choice we make right now determines our future. And for so many decades, governments have known in this province, across Canada and around the world, that we need to transform our economy. It's not a matter of making a choice. It's a matter of responsibility that we have to future generations, to our own children, who are looking to us, gathering in the streets, 100,000 youth in Vancouver gathering to listen to Greta Thunberg tell us the adults haven't lived up to their end of the deal. We need the adults to start living up to that end of the deal. Every investment needs to ensure that it addresses the needs right now and builds the future we owe to our children. Thank you, Ms. Fristineau. It is now time for the same question to all of the leaders. As per the draw, we're starting again with you, Ms. Fristineau, then Mr. Wilkinson, then Mr. Horgan. More than 150 British Columbians have died of COVID-19 while living in long-term care. Their deaths revealed many vulnerabilities in the way this province looks after its aged, including the role of private for-profit facilities. My question to each of you, is there a place for private for-profit care in the care of our seniors? First, Ms. Firstino, and you have one minute. Right now, for, there are many private for-profit care homes in BC, although we've seen some pretty significant problems where the province had to take over the operation of some of those homes with retirement concept. What we are proposing is to recognize that any private for-profit <coughs> care home that is giving, getting government funding, that we know exactly how they're spending that money, that there is complete transparency and accountability, that that is going towards care hours, care hours for seniors because what we've seen is that they under, under deliver in care hours. What we need to move to is a not-for-profit care home system, long-term care system in British Columbia because seniors are not a commodity. Seniors are people that earn, deserve our dig dignity and respect and care and we want to ensure that not-for-profit cooperative uh, care homes are the future for this province. Thank you. Mr. Wilkinson. Well, thanks for the question, and my medical background is very helpful in this, and I've worked in long-term care facilities as a doctor. And the issue is, how do you keep the standards up? Who owns the concrete building is much less important than the care provided at the bedside. And that's why we have said it's time to invest a billion dollars over five years into building private rooms for everybody who wants them in long-term care facilities. We've also said that the safest and most secure place for seniors is to have them in their own home as long as possible. So we're saying it's time to put forward a tax credit system that supports seniors living in the right place, usually their own home to start with, in the comfort and security of their home, which is the safest place to be during a pandemic, and have them uh, able to get a credit for home care, for housekeeping services, for house repairs, so that seniors can live in dignity as long as they want to in their own home, and then move into a properly regulated care facility with the standards of care that I expect. 
Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Uh, I believe the balance in British Columbia needs to be right. Not for profit, run by uh, those others that are run by the health authorities across BC, and there's a place for for profit care. The issue is where are we going to find the people? When we came to government, nine in 10 care homes in British Columbia did not have the staff to meet the basic minimum standards that the former government had set for care in a day. Nine out of 10. And so that means that the 10,000 workers that were fired at the turn of the century were not able to help seniors when COVID hit. So we did two things. Firstly, we stopped that we put in place a single site rule so that workers who were struggling to make ends meet by working in multiple locations would focus on just one. We stopped contract flipping, which is something Sonia and I talked about earlier in, in the year, about making sure that we were not having for-profit companies flipping contracts and driving down wages and forcing people to work in more facilities. The the solution is more workers. We're going to hire 7,000 to care for our seniors. Thank you. And now it is time for the leaders to take a turn debating pandemic recovery. Leaders, each of you are going to have a chance to ask a question of another leader of your choice for 15 seconds. That's going to be followed by an answer uninterrupted for 30 seconds before a minute and a half of two-way free debate. And I'll remind you that the leader who is not involved in this segment does not speak. Once again, the order was chosen for questioning by a draw. And the first question to another leader goes to Mr. Wilkinson. To you, sir. Thanks, Jachi. We heard last Thursday that one quarter of the businesses in British Columbia expect to close forever within 12 months. There was an emergency relief package that all three parties voted in support of, but this election has blocked it. John, why would you block that package being sent out? That package is out right now, Andrew, and you know that. The tax breaks that were part of our package, the, uh, the relief on P GST or PST, rather, for business that are investing in machinery and equipment to retain workers is going out the door in the middle of September. The tax credit for those businesses also went out the door. The programs for small businesses have criteria. They're in place. The grant applications are in play. People are asking for those grant applications. They're filling them out. Public servants, not politicians, will make the decision and those dollars will fl flow as quickly as possible. And I think you know that every other province in Canada rolled out their emergency relief package in June or July. You dragged it out until three days before the election because you thought it would serve your interests. How can we trust you to look after our small businesses and our issues in British Columbia when you did this for purely self-serving reasons so that you could have an election to try to secure your employment for the next four years. We what about the 150,000 people working in tourism who have no revenue this year? They look for relief now, and what you did was effectively block it by saying you'd have a consultation process we talk that to would British go Columbians, on for the rest Andrew, of the year. Mr. We Wilkinson, talk, let Mr. Horgan respond. We talk to British Columbians, Andrew, which is what I think leaders are supposed to do. There's a litany of examples of where BC Liberals decided that they knew best, and we've been patching those holes since we were sworn in as government. The Greens and I worked together to patch many of those holes, but there's much more work to do. Of the $6 billion between budgets that we approved, $3.5 billion of it went out the door in March. The last bit was in consultation with British Columbians and businesses who wanted to know where to go. I think the tourism you know. sector said, give us an advisory committee. We put it in place and they'll decide where that money spent. Well, exactly. There was an advisory committee on the emergency relief At package. Request. They At put out their reports in July and you stalled and stalled. And now those tourism operators have nothing until next year because you chose to leave them out in the breeze. We put in place. That's not leadership, John. We put That's in self-interest. We put in and your self Mr. Wilkinson, let Mr. Horgan we respond. We put in place opportunities for grants. You wanted to give them lines of credit. When you don't have any money, asking to borrow more is not the right answer. We are putting grants in place. It's the right way to go, and that's what tourism asks for. All right, and that is time. Uh, Mr. Horgan, now you have a turn to ask a question. You've chosen to ask a question of Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, I have. And Mr. Ms. Verstenho, you will not be involved in this segment of the debate. Uh, Mr. Horgan, to you, 15 seconds for your question. Thank you. And it goes back to health care and long-term care. Nine out of 10 care homes not having a, a sufficient staff to do the job. The BC Liberals put a big hole in the budget in 2001 by giving tax breaks to the wealthiest, firing 10,000 people. Looking back on that now, was that the right choice to make? You know, when I became involved in the BC Civil Service in 2001, the health budget was $8 billion. It's now $23 billion, and that growth happened under the BC Liberals. We built 14 hospitals, whereas in their 13 years in office out of the last 30, the NDP have built no hospitals at all. Nonsense. We're de devoted to health care, and I as a physician am completely devoted to the idea of having high quality health care for everyone in British Columbia, and I'll never be ashamed to say so. 
You fired 10,000 people, largely women, to give a tax break to the wealthiest people in BC. Your former colleague, George Abbott, wrote a book about it. I, I commend it to your Christmas reading. It was the wrong thing to do. It focused on people who didn't need help and punished those who did. That doesn't John, build community, this, it doesn't build our economy, this and it is certainly your, didn't help seniors when the pandemic hit. This is your recurring theme of creating this division amongst British Columbians of us and them. You put out a brochure for your candidates saying how to divide British Columbians. We're talking about bringing people to Together. We have to work together through this pandemic, and calling names and talking about things that happened 17 years ago will not help us get into the future. We've the got to work together. The consequences, Andrew, of your decisions were profound and tragic for seniors who found themselves in a pandemic without sufficient people to help them and others who were going from place to place to place to make ends meet. That's a profound mistake. I think you should acknowledge that, take responsibility for it, and then we can start to build well, John, the togetherness I think we that you're have talking to take about responsibility for things like not building any hospitals, even though we've made promises, promises, promises. You've said the South Surrey Hospital would open multiple times. Nothing's you ever happened. You sold the land, man. You, we bought you said the land the to build Memorial the hospital, hospital and would you go sold ahead. it. Nothing's ever happened. You the NDP sold it. Mr. Not Mr. Built Horgan. A, the NDP have not built a single hospital in their 13 years in power of the last 30. We built 14 and we're proud of it because we invest in health care. We had to catch up with the NDP failure in the medical school. You shrank it from 160 to 120 places. We're really, and we that's, grew it to and gentlemen, gentlemen, that is time. It is now time for Ms. First to know to ask her question. Your question, I understand, is going to Mr. Horgan. It's yours. Thank you, Shachi. And uh, to Mr. Horgan, uh, to John, I will say, you know, we've th you've thrown us into this unnecessary election. You've put people into a place of unease at a time when we're facing this global pandemic. And you're campaigning in different writings, indicating that infrastructure that you have promised could be at risk uh, with the outcome of this election. I don't think it's a time to put more fear into people's hearts when we need to be assuring them that we're here for them. Ms. Rustino, that's, that's you your time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sonia, for the question. And I did grapple with the decision to call the election, but I did so because I believe we need to put the politics behind us. What we're seeing this evening is opportunities for British Columbians to hear from myself, Sonia, and Andrew on what their vision is for British Columbia. How are they gonna solve the challenges we face because of COVID-19? None of us anticipated this. We didn't think about it in 2000, uh, 2017, 2018, or 2019. We didn't think about it in February when we tabled our balanced budget. We only thought about it in, in March when it hit us right in the face. We need leadership now, not for a few months, but for the next few years. It's astonishing to hear you say that we, you needed to put politics behind us by putting us into politics front and center in a campaign election when we didn't need it. And what we had in the legislature, what British Columbians were counting on and so grateful for, was we actually put a, a scientist out in front. We put politics behind us. All three parties indicated and acted on ensuring that we were putting people first. We were putting the, the needs that people had to have met in a global pandemic first. That's what we should be doing right now. That's what we're not doing. We're here on the stage debating things. When we we should be in the legislature making it, sure people are getting it's, what it's, they need. It's never a bad idea to ask British Columbians where they want to go and who they want to lead them. It this is, a is bad an idea when you break an agreement idea. and you break the legislation. It was three and a half years since the last election. That is an eternity with COVID-19. We need to make sure that British Columbians understand that we are going to stop this on the 24th of October and dedicate every ounce of our energy to making sure they're safe, making sure they're secure, and their families get through this. I think That's what we need to do. Us talking about how we get there is a good thing, not a bad thing. I think Asking British, British Columbians Mr. to choose Horgan, is not a bad thing. I think thing. what British Columbians need to understand is that you're willing to break your word, you're willing to break agreements, and you're willing to break legislation that you yourself passed in the legislature I'm in order to put the interests of your party, in order to seek that power and that majority it's that you so want. It's not about us, Sonia. For it's not about us. It's about British Columbians. It's about British Columbians. They deserve that's time, to have Mr. That Horgan. We're moving on, and thank you all. We are now moving on to the next set of questions about the cost of living, housing affordability, child care, and transportation. First up to you, Mr. Horgan. The first question. Your government introduced a number of measures to make housing more affordable, but according to Statistics Canada, British Columbians and more than one in seven BC households continue to live in a place that is considered unsuitable, inadequate, or unaffordable. What other tools do you have to help and support people struggling with 
housing affordability in this province. You have one minute, sir. Thank you very much. Well, the challenges of housing have been enormous. In 2017, it was the number one issue on everyone's minds, particularly those who live in the Lower Mainland, where they saw the average house price in, in Vancouver go up by $600,000 over two years, because the focus of the former government was on speculation and money laundering, not on people, not on roofs over their head, not on affordability. We brought in a host of measures, again, working with the Green Caucus to make life more affordable. We've seen the curve drop down on the cost of housing. It's still unacceptably high in metropolitan areas, but in the rest of British Columbia, we're building not-for-profit housing. We're focusing on co-ops again. We're making sure that renters get a bit of a break. We give homeowner grants to people who are fortunate enough to own a home. We should give renters a break as well. That's what we've been focusing on, bringing costs down for people in the whole continuum of housing they're looking for. It's not just houses in Shaughnessy, it's houses all over BC. And we need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to have the dignity of a roof over their head. All right, now let's focus, Mr. Horgan, again to you on one of your signature promises, and that's $10 a day daycare. Child care advocates say so far, the vast majority of eligible families are not able to access this benefit. Your own timeline called for $10 a day child care province-wide by 2027. Can you still deliver on this? I'm confident that we can. We wanted to bring forward $10 a day child care. Our colleagues in the legislature would not support that. So we put in place pilots. We put in place a, re a fee reduction so that British Columbians were not paying as much. And it's been transformative for families. Countless people talk to me about how they now have money in their pocket, their children are in secure, stable, affordable, accessible childcare spaces, and we can and must do more. The pandemic showed us graphically the need to make sure that children are safe while parents are out working. Not just frontline workers during the pandemic, but right across the board. Access to childcare has been a problem. It was ignored by the previous government. We've made it our priority. We worked with our colleagues to make the best of a bad situation. We wanted to go with $10 a day all in. We didn't have that support. That's why we're putting it in front of British Columbians again, this campaign, to let them know that we believe that $10 a day is achievable and it's something that we need to strive for and we can get it done in the next seven years. Thank you. Ms. First to know to you, the BC Greens are promising free care for children younger than three and free early childhood education for three and four-year-olds. Now, you've not provided costing for this. How do you propose to pay for these programs? You have one minute. Thank you, Shachi. And just to set the record clear on what John is saying here, of course we worked with them to bring child care and early childhood education. There is a long record of documents that shows that. And it's a, it's a little disingenuous to not put the truth about that working relationship. But in terms of our plan for childhood, early childhood education, what we have in that plan is to roll it into our public education system so that every parent of a three and four year old knows that they have that 25 hours of early childhood education. We include that into the cost of our public education. We've put uh, over 100 million towards this in terms of uh, ensuring that we can have those spaces built into our public schools, recognizing there is nothing more important in a child's educational career than that start of early childhood education at three and four years old. We want to have the most successful province that we possibly can. It starts with early childhood education. Thank you. Your next question. Another key promise of yours is to implement a four-day work week in a minority government. Would you insist that a governing partner move forward with this promise? Is it a deal breaker? To be clear, the promise isn't to implement a four-day work week. It is to work with stakeholders, with labor, with businesses, to incentivize and find ways to support businesses to create a more healthy work-life balance for them and their employees. We've seen examples of this in other countries. Uh, in Japan, where Microsoft Japan went to a four-day work week and saw an increase in productivity and an increase in, in worker health and happiness. We have to look at the world we're in right now and say, how can we have the healthiest, most thriving population possible? And we've had all of these increases in productivity and working from home, and yet we still adhere to this 100-year-old idea of working five days a week. If we can have more productivity, more revenue, better health outcomes, better mental health, better work-life balance, let's look at the ways to do that and work together with stakeholders, business, and labor to bring those programs forward. Thank you, Ms. Fristino. Mr. Wilkinson, to you now. 
You've promised to privatize ICBC, but a look at the rates in Alberta show that private car insurance for some drivers is skyrocketing. So how are you going to ensure that your plans to privatize auto insurance will bring down rates for everyone, including young drivers? And you have a minute, sir. What we're talking about is competition. Privatization is a confusing term. What we're talking about is keep the ICBC no-fault model and allow other insurers to offer their products in competition. They do it in Saskatchewan. It works in different places across Canada in different forms. And what's the concern? Why would you not allow competition and see if they can come out with a better price? The same thing's true not just for the bodily injury from car accidents, but also from the vehicle damage. Let's have competition and see what the choices are and let people make up their own minds. People are really tired of being pushed around by the ICBC monopoly, being told that they have no choice. We've seen this with young people who've seen their rates go through the roof from $1,500 to $7,000 under the NDP. That's not acceptable. So we've said give those younger drivers two or four years credit on their driving record depending on whether or not they've taken driver education. We can do better. We don't just have to live with this old dinosaur of ICBC. Nobody else in the world uses it, and why do we? Thank you. And your next question, sir. During your party's last term, the average cost of a new home in Metro Vancouver increased 50%. According to Dr. Peter German's report, the role of dirty money laundered through provincially regulated casinos was a part of the problem. If elected, will you commit to continuing the money laundering inquiry? Of course. I practiced law for 25 years. Mr. Justice Cullen is a highly respected member of the judiciary. He needs to get on with his work, and he suspended his work to stay out of the politics of this election. So the Cullen inquiry needs to proceed, and the issue that you first started with was housing prices. Under the NDP, this last year alone, condo prices are up another 10% in Vancouver. Condo insurance is up anywhere from 40 to 400% under the NDP. It's not working. Their housing program is not exactly a housing program. It's an increased cost housing program. After all of the talk, after all of the promises, after all of the overblown uh, promises of the NDP, housing is still a major problem. And we have said there's a better way to deal with this. We've got to anticipate the supply of housing for the 60,000 people coming to British Columbia every year, year after year. We need to do better by providing housing for everybody in British Columbia. That will bring the price down rather than the tight market the NDP Thank left. you, thank you. And now again, it is time for some leader-to-leader -leader debate, this time on the cost of living. Same rules apply, a 15-second question, a 30-second uninterrupted answer, and a minute and a half of free debate. And the first question this round for another leader goes to you, Ms. Furstenau. Thank you, Shachi, and my question is for Andrew. Uh, you're proposing a massive cut, tax cut to the PST. And, you, and you'll say that this is to help cost of living, but it has no actual outcomes. When you take the revenue out of what we need right now to be able to provide services to Come the people to the of question, BC, Ms. First to how can you justify that? Our view is that British Columbia is in a tight spot now. This is like a wartime economy when we hear that a quarter of businesses may close within a year and half of our families expect someone to be unemployed in the next year. So we've said it's time to turbocharge the BC economy. If we drop the PST to zero for a year, businesses will reinvest. Things will go on sale. People will buy equipment and they will go out shopping and they will enjoy their lives right here in British Columbia because it has to be spent in British Columbia to get the tax break. That's time and now free debate between the two of you. And the, the challenge with this is that you can't really identify outcomes that would come from that PST cut. What we need and what economists are telling us right now is that we need to invest in services, we need to invest in infrastructure, we need to build the economy that we want. Taking that six or seven billion dollar hole in revenue can really undermine government's ability in addition to your platform which seems to have a pretty massive deficit attached to it. Why would you want to put more deficit into the government's coffers right now when we need to be investing every penny into the future that we want to build. And your point is right. We need to be investing every penny we've got. Governments can borrow money very cheaply these days. That's why we need to build infrastructure to create employment, to get people going and building British Columbia. And we're talking about an investment that the BC Business Council said was one of their highest priorities. When they advised 
John Horgan in the summertime. He ignored their advice. They said cut the PST in half for two years. We said let's cut it fully for a year because this pandemic is not going away quickly. We've got to boost the economy and that's a very good way to do it according seen, to the economists. We've seen the results that happen in the early 2000s when there's a 25% tax cut across the board. We saw cuts in services. We see the results of that right now 20 years down the road when people are suffering from mental health issues, from housing and homelessness. This is what is the outcome of those kinds of tax cuts. And I have said there will be no cuts to government services under a BC Liberal government. We've got to keep the budget going because those people sleeping in the park thank near my house Thank you, need Mr. A home. Wilkinson. Thank you. That is time. But now back to you with a question to Mr. Horgan. You have 15 seconds for your question. Well, coming back to housing, we've learned that condominium prices have gone up by 10% in the last year in Vancouver. House prices are up 5%. Condo insurance up as much as 400%. You promised British Columbians affordable housing. to eliminate the speculation tax so the speculators that used to support the BC Liberals can get back to the good old days, the wild west of driving up costs. The speculation tax has meant that 11,000 condominiums that were vacant are now being populated by renters. That's bringing down costs for regular people and you know full well that if you give back to the 1% that are affected by the spec tax, the $115 million, we'll have no money to build the housing that we need. It works for everybody, it's very popular except with BC Liberals. Well, I think you know the rents in Metro Vancouver are up $2,000 per year since your government took office. That's not true. Your housing plan is a complete fiasco That's because the cost of housing is the highest it's ever been while incomes are actually going down. Rental situations are still difficult because the rent um, vacancy rate is still the same as it was when you took office. We've got a big problem here, Mr. Horgan, because your housing policy has produced no results whatsoever. Yeah, again, and Andrew, we say it's time to increase the supply of housing. You got to get out of your neighborhood. You got to get out of your neighborhood and talk to people, my friend. It's working for lots and lots of people. AJ, who was living in a tent in Maple Ridge, is now living in a house. He's no longer using drugs. He has a job, and he gets to watch football on a Sunday afternoon. We take that stuff for granted. But when you don't have a house and one is provided for you, it changes your life. That's what our policies are doing. You want to go back to let the speculators drive up. We'll make a lot of one bedroom condominiums in downtown Vancouver and leave everybody else to fend for themselves. Housing belongs to everyone in every corner of BC and that's what we're focused on. If we want to talk about your record on homelessness, we'll get into that shortly and it's pretty appalling, oh, Mr. People, Horgan. Man. What we're talking about here is people who are trying to look for a place to live for the long term. Renters can't find anything. Their rents have gone up under your watch. And similarly, the cost of housing, someone it, it, interested almost, in buying. It's almost like you did the, cost the is world existed before 2017. I, I mean, know the truth hurts, 17 John, years. but you John, have to admit the truth And that's point. time. That's it. Now to Mr. Horgan with a question yeah. for Ms. Fristenau. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, you sided with the BC Liberals and did not support us uh, doing away with tolls in the Lower Mainland. You tried to block, in fact, you did block a, a hydro bill this summer that would have brought down hydro rates for people, and you do not support our COVID benefit of $1,000. If we're not going to help people with affordability in the pandemic, when would we? Well, I, it's interesting, the COVID benefit of $1,000, I think that, John, you brought that out as a campaign promise, uh, not something that was ever in the legislature. Uh, the tolls on the bridges, uh, the BC Hydro decisions, these are like short-term decisions. We need to be making long-term decisions in this province that get us to a place of resiliency, that recognize that we have to have uh, ways of getting people around mobility uh, that doesn't rely on single passenger vehicles. We saw an uptick in traffic after those tolls were taken off and you used it as an excuse to go ahead with Site C because of the deficit that it created in the yeah. budget. We, we, we uh, eliminated the tolls and that put, put, took pressure off the other congestion points in the Lower Mainland and allowed people to use modern infrastructure that they shouldn't have to pay for just like other infrastructure in British Columbia. It's built for all of us. It should be out of our tax base. That that's our position, that's our value. With respect to short-term solutions for people who are struggling, of course that's what we need to do, especially in a pandemic. And driving down hydro rates is a way to do that. Under the BC Liberals, it was an instant oh. teller machine. They Let's just talk kept about pulling money out. Let's talk about the impact that Site C is going to have on, on hydro rates in the future. And let's recognize that you're also talking about undermining the resiliency and the local energy production of First Nations. They had invested their money in the past. This was a bill that was going to Every wipe out their economic Every single the interest project that was approved went ahead. Uh, Every single project. Once again, to, know, to Mr. Horgan. Continue. 
billions of dollars in surplus energy because of the choices of the BC Liberals with private power production is why we're in the mess we're in. Every indigenous program that was on the books is going ahead. We put a stop to just giving money to developers so that we could focus on core competency at hydro and bringing costs down for people. That was That's what we need to do. John, I'm not sure who you were talking to, but that was certainly not what we were hearing from First Nations and Indigenous communities around the province or from Union of BC Indian Chiefs or First Nations Leadership Council. This was your first chance Every to do project. a bill with the lens of UNDRIP, and you didn't do it. Every project was by Indigenous people and was approved we and going are, forward. We are moving on. We're out of time, I'm afraid. And we're going to now move on in this vein to the environment, resource policy, and climate targets. We're going to start with a question to each of you. Uh, on which each of you will answer consecutively according to draw, beginning with the Greens, then the Liberals, then the NDP. You will each have one minute. So beginning with you, Ms. Firstenau, do you believe that reconciliation with First Nations requires a province to fully consider Indigenous opposition to resource developments in their territories, even if it means the project will never be built? You have one minute. Thank you. And when we passed the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, it was to start a new relationship, a new chapter of reconciliation in this province. That chapter is going to be very long. We have to keep working towards more and more reconciliation, recognizing that decisions have been made about First Nations peoples and their territories for hundreds of years in this country, not taking into account the impacts it has on them or on their well-being. We have unbelievable and unacceptable rates of poverty amongst First Nations and Indigenous peoples and we have to work in a government-to-government -government relationship to ensure that we are investing in a future that is sustainable and healthy for all of them as well as a future that is sustainable and healthy for every British Columbian. It can't just be words, it has to be action. It can't be the same old of say one thing and do another. Thank you. And to you, Mr. Wilkinson. Well, I think we've got a bright future in British Columbia if we engage all of the people in all the decisions. It's very important to be able to move ahead with natural resource projects, and those get reconciled by negotiation. And in so many circumstances, we have First Nations who are very, very keen on resource development in their communities as a chance to get ahead. We have to have the right resource benefits agreements. We have to have the right uh, resource income sharing agreements in place, and we have to work with First Nations whenever possible. Sometimes conflicts arise because of linear projects that go through many different territories. The right place to resolve those is in the courts. It's the orderly, peaceful way to do things because blockades simply don't work. It just gets in everyone's way and causes tension and unhappiness. We have to look at a British Columbia where everybody's invested in our future so they all can benefit, whether it's from solar power, whether it's from uh, wind power, whether it's from liquid natural gas, indigenous-led projects are going to be part of the future for British Columbia, and John Horgan did his best That's to time. cancel That's time. Thank you. Them. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. And now to you, Mr. Horgan. One Thanks. minute to answer. Would you like a repeat of the question? Or no, you I got, got it. it. I'm okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Sachi. I am very proud to have been the Premier that introduced uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in our legislature. I'm equally proud that my two colleagues on the stage tonight unanimously supported it. We did that, as Sonia said, to try and erase a stain of 150 years of col colonialism on land that the Supreme Court of Canada has said is rights and title existing for nations right across this province. The Musqueam territory we're on today is unseated. The challenges of keeping our economy going when we're just starting starting to reconcile after 150 years of occupation is daunting. But I agree with Andrew, this will shock everybody, but I agree with him that we need to make sure that everyone dials into the projects that need to go forward. It is not all one size for everybody. The tall tan in the Northwest can't wait for economic activity. Other communities are more re uh, reluctant to do that. Cooperation, collaboration, and dialogue with everyone will bring prosperity to Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples alike. I'm proud of what the three of us did on that occasion, and I think we can do more together. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. And coming back to you now on an individual question. Your government has called ICBC a dumpster fire for the BC Liberals. Is the Site C Dam project your dumpster fire? The project is billions of dollars over budget. BC Hydro has reported serious structural issues with construction and has offered no clear fix. 
Will you go ahead with this project? You have a minute, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, it wasn't my project. I didn't start it. The BC Liberals did. The former Premier, her only motivation was not to build clean energy for British Columbia, not to attach it to a climate action plan, but get it past the point of no return. It was the most difficult decision we had to make as a government in the first few weeks of our time in office. We brought in experts on both sides of the issue. We grappled with it and made the determination that $4 billion was already spent, and we felt that taxpayers shouldn't absorb that when we could have clean, green energy into the future. So we proceeded with the project. New challenges have come forward. We've appointed an individual who used to work for uh, Mr. Wilkinson's government to look at the economics, to look at the engineering, and report back to government. When we see that report, we'll make a decision. I'm not going to foreclose anything at this point in time. Site C was not our project. We inherited it. We're doing the best we can for the ratepayers and the people of British Columbia. It's a daunting challenge, but I believe we're up for it. Next question to you, sir, and let's talk about something that has happened on your watch, and that's your government allowing the continued export of raw logs, the ongoing construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, LNG, and again, Site C. Why would a voter who puts climate issues first ever support the NDP? Well, certainly the Kinder Morgan project is not a project that we supported. We went all the way to the Supreme Court to try and block it. We did everything in our power, used all the tools in our toolbox. The federal government intervened, bought the project, and is proceeding with it. The former government tied the hands of our government and the, our colleagues in the Green Caucus were of one mind on how we went forward on Kinder Morgan, or now Trans Mountain. LNG is something I've always supported, provided it sits within our economic framework as well as our climate action plan. I believe LNG Canada in Kitimat is going to create thousands and thousands of jobs, the largest private sector investment in BC history. Indigenous people are fully dialed in to make some benefits for their communities and create some wealth that will be spread throughout the North and throughout British Columbia. I believe it's a good project that fits within our plan and I'm very proud of it. All right. To you, Ms. First to know. You've promised a carbon neutral province by 2045. You've said you'll end oil and gas subsidies and put the money into retraining workers for employment in a green economy. But frankly, there are a lot of people who are worried about being left behind. What do you say to them? You have one minute. We can't leave people behind in the transition of our economy, but we can't leave young people behind by not transitioning the economy. We have to do this. So many governments have not done it in the past. We're now in the emergency that we're in. And propping up an industry with taxpayer money, as these two have decided to do with the fracking and LNG of LNG Canada, $6 billion to keep it afloat because it can't make it on its own makes no sense. But if we were building a clean economy with renewable energy, instead of going ahead with Site C, which is to provide subsidized electricity to fracking, we could have invested that money into green, clean, clean energy projects in every region of this province and have those family-sustaining jobs in every part of BC. Instead, all the poker chips on LNG and fracking and the largest point source emission project in Canada. Thank you. Your next question. Your caucus opposed the NDP moving forward on big fossil fuel projects, but you continued to support the Horgan government. You were a part of that caucus, Ms. First to know. Did the Greens abandon their principles in pursuit of power? You know, people talk about balance of power. We always talked about balance of responsibility and the responsibility that we had not just to, to bring uh, things around on one issue. We have to serve everybody in British Columbia and right now people need us to be focusing on their needs. This is the hardest winter that people and businesses, tourism operators are going to face and we should be serving them. That is the approach that we took these last three and a half years. Yes, we should not be moving forward with these projects. We voted against the LNG tax bill 14 times. It was Andrew and the BC Liberals that collaborated with the NDP to pass that bill, not us. We voted against it. And we also supported all of the measures focusing on housing, focusing on social services, focusing on ensuring in this last year that people are getting the support and the help, and the help they need from government. That's what we need to do. Thank you. To you, Mr. Wilkinson, your first question. 
The B.C. Liberals under Gordon Campbell made history by implementing a carbon tax. The B.C. Liberals under Christy Clark froze long-planned increases to that tax. If elected, what will your B.C. Liberals do with a currently scheduled 10% increase to this tax? You have one minute. The carbon tax was brought in as an innovative measure to address climate change. And we have ended up with the most fuel-efficient vehicle fleet in Canada as a result. It's been plateaued at certain periods when the federal government got involved because we couldn't be out of step with the federal government. But in terms of climate change, British Columbia's got a real opportunity. In spite of John Horgan wanting to import dirty American power and shut down Aboriginal operated uh, power projects in British Columbia this summer, which was voted against by the other two parties and never went anywhere, we've said we can make British Columbia a clean energy powerhouse once again. We can do wind and solar. We know that oil is going to be phased out in the next 30 years or so, so let's make British Columbia the powerhouse it should be, and that's possible because we are so good at what we do in electrical power. We also need electric charging stations for vehicles around the province so that we can make transportation cleaner and greener. This is our plan to make British Columbia the clean energy powerhouse it should be. At uh, that time, Mr. Wilkinson, it wasn't a clear answer to the question. Would you like 10 seconds to answer it again? The carbon tax has to be in synchronization with the federal carbon program. We all know that, and it will move ahead incrementally in concert with the federal government. All right. You have said, if elected, that you would stop Trans Mountain protesters who are protesting the pipeline. But Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights guarantees freedom of expression and association. So how, then, do you propose to stop these protests? Well, the courts in Canada are very accustomed to dealing with these kinds of things. We see it regularly across Canada. And what we have to do is say that these disputes have to be resolved in the courts, not by blocking railroad tracks, not by blocking the uh, West Coast Express and leaving 5,000 people stranded so they can't get home for dinner and pick up their kids from daycare. We need an orderly way of dealing with these things. Protest is completely legitimate, but the courts have made it very clear that protest has to be within reasonable limits, and their tolerance can be tested at times where they will actually imp impose criminal contempt charges upon these individuals. It's fair enough to protest. It's a very valid thing, and here on this university campus it happens all the time. But it's got to be respectful. It cannot be destructive, it cannot be disrespectful, and it needs to be resolved in the courts, not on the railway tracks of British Columbia. Thank you. And now it is time for leader-to-leader -leader debate, this time on the environment. So to remind everyone, it's a 15-second question, 30 seconds of uninterrupted answers, followed by a minute and a half of free debate. Now the first direct question to another leader in this round goes to Mr. Horgan. I understand you have a question for Mr. Wilkinson. I do. Uh, Andrew Weaver and the Green Caucus and I worked on the most progressive climate action plan in North America. Clean BC is leading the way everywhere on this continent. You stopped caring about climate change about 2011. What can you say to British Columbians about whether you would pick up where Sonia and I left off? Well, let's be clear. Clean BC is a bit of a sham. Greenhouse gases have gone up regularly each year under the NDP. Nothing has been accomplished. And at the same time, the Clean BC plan doesn't even have funding allocated to it for 25% of the targets. So your Clean BC plan is a giant hot air balloon with not much in it, Mr. Horgan. We have to have a real plan that will actually work with the federal government to make sure we're addressing climate change. And that's why I say British Columbia should be a clean energy powerhouse so we can electrify our transportation. Clean BC is a continent-leading plan that the Greens and the NDP worked on together. It is trend-setting for the rest of Canada. Mr. Wilkinson's plan about being an energy powerhouse involves making sure that developer friends got power purchase agreements to drive up costs for hydro users. That's not a plan to create a clean economy. That's a plan to create money for speculators and your wealthy friends. We need a plan that works for everybody. Do we need charging stations around BC? Yes, we do. We have more than any other jurisdiction in North America, and we need to keep building on that. John, you need to tell the truth. We're in a pandemic. People are in crisis. It's like when you have a very ill patient in the hospital. You tell them the truth. And when you say that clean BC is continent leading, it's a sham. Nonsense. We all know it's a sham. Nonsense. Greenhouse gas emissions have gone up every year on your watch, and the plan isn't even properly funded. So we need to do something real in British Columbia, not do the blame game that John Horgan constantly plays, looking for a snake under every rock. There's always someone to blame. 
We need to actually work for British Columbians and get things done Man, we because did. we're we in did. a pandemic and we require a, an economy the, the that will build us into the future. Mr. Wilkinson, he brought let forward Mr. the plan. Wilkinson. It is funded. We're continuing to work on it. We're funding more spaces in our universities for science, math, engineering, and technology so that we can have our younger people unlock the challenges of the future. And that's, that's how you build the plan that works. You drove up tuition fees. You did away with grants for kids going to school. You're not building a BC. You're shutting it down for your friends to make more money. Ms. Fristino, you now have a question to Mr. Horgan. Thank you, Chachi. And the question is around uh, old growth. We have precious little old growth left in British Columbia. And under your government, the logging of old growth continued at the same rate as it did under the previous government. How do you answer the people who recognize the importance of protecting old growth at a time like this? Uh, thank you, Sonia, for the question. And I recall that you were very supportive of the report that came to us that we commissioned to look at how we could manage old growth going forward. It re will result in the deferment of 353,000 hectares of old growth forest into the future. I think that's a positive plan. We need to consult with Indigenous peoples because at the end of the day, the land that our forests are on ultimately belongs to them. That collaboration can't happen overnight. I think the plan is in place. A few weeks ago, you thought it was a good one. I don't know why you don't think it's so good today. Well, that plan, I would say, is in place because we pushed for action on old growth. We were the only voices in the BC legislature raising it. And I will point to the kind of new math that gets used all the time in talking about what is protected. It often includes scrubby, subalpine uh, trees, not the deep river ba valley bottoms of old growth that we all consider to be that iconic and the responsibility that we have as a province to protect some of the last old growth in the world. This is so important. Your government has shown that they're not interested in protecting old growth and it's going to go. I just disagree with you, Sonia. We put in place uh, experts to come back and tell us where we should go, and we're implementing that plan. That's what responsible governments do. I live on Vancouver Island just like you. My constituency includes some of the most spectacular old growth in the province, as does yours. I understand the value of that to British Columbians long term, and that's why we've got a plan in place that involves Indigenous peoples, industry, workers, and people who are passionate about the environment. That's how you make progress. We've been doing that for three and a half years. I believe we can continue to do that into the future. I believe we could be doing that right now, actually. We didn't need to be in this election. But I also believe that I've seen reports about four out of five regions in British Columbia are not only logging old growth unsustainably, but logging all forests unsustainably, exceeding what the government levels of sustainability are, and cutting down way more trees than we can afford in this province. We need sustainable forestry in this province. That is, we, we that is, I'm sorry, that is time, and it is time now for Mr. Wilkinson's question to Ms. Firstenau. Thank you, and Sonia, your party made John Horgan Premier. He broke his deal with you three weeks ago. He broke his own law on fixed election dates. He called this election for purely selfish reasons. Can John Horgan be trusted on the environment or anything for that matter? Thank you, Andrew, for the question. And, and, and I think that what we need right now, more than ever, we're in a global pandemic, is we need people to be able to recognize that when people are elected, when we are elected to office, that we put aside partisanship and we put our duty to service above all. And this is what we've been doing in the legislature. We haven't agreed on everything, but we have put that service in front of everything else. We need to get back to that. And I'm glad you bring up the concept of duty because it's something that was hardwired into me as a practicing doctor. You've got a duty to the patient, just like Dr. Henry has a duty to every one of us in British Columbia to protect our health. And we fully support her work. And so this issue of duty comes up and we look to Mr. Horgan and say, where did your duties lie when you called this election three weeks ago for no reason other than to protect your own f job security? Yes, Nobody maybe. wants this election except you. Yes, and yes, maybe. I've been working with uh, Ms. First now through the summertime to make sure the funding was in place to deal with the pandemic. We all worked in a very collegial way. I said back in March, we need to fight the virus, not each other. And Ms. First now and I proceeded on that basis. So. Where do you think we can go in British Columbia with a premier like this who breaks all the rules after people have agreed to act in a trusting manner to serve the people of British Columbia? More than any other time, I think in any of our lifetimes, we have overlapping emergencies. What I would like to see 
is for all of us to agree that we have to treat these emergencies the way we treated COVID-19, where we said, this is above partisanship. We have to put the health and well-being of people first. We should be doing that with the opioid and overdose crisis. We should be doing that with the housing and homelessness crisis. We should be doing that to ensure that we have sustainable transportation that's accessible and affordable for everybody in this province. We should be making sure that teachers feel safe in their classrooms. We should all be arising above partisanship in a time like this. And that is time for that segment. It is now time to move on to uh, issues surrounding social issues, including racism and inclusion, homelessness, and the opioid crisis. And we're going to start this segment with a personal question to each of you about racism. You're going to answer this question consecutively, first beginning with Mr. Wilkinson, then Mr. Horgan, then Ms. Furstenau. And the question is this. This has been a time of tough conversations about the inclusion and treatment of those who are black and indigenous and people of color. How have you personally reckoned with your own privilege and unconscious bias as a white political leader? We're going to give you a little bit of extra time on this question. You have a minute and 15, each of you do. This is a very important question for all of us to look into ourselves to answer. I came from Alberta as a young doctor, started work at St. Paul's Hospital, and met people from parts of the world I'd never come across before. I had to get used to the idea that it wasn't all like southern Alberta, that there's a more complex world out there. I then worked in indigenous communities, Dees Lake, Lillooet, Campbell River, dealing with a lot of indigenous people as patients. Got to know them, got to know their way of life, and I believe there's a, a young, maybe not so young man in Lillooet now who was named after me when I delivered that baby from his mother. And so that's the kind of experience that humanizes it for you and makes you realize we are all equal. We all have to feel like we belong here, that we're citizens, and we'll be respected in British Columbia. And to my mind, that's one of the highest duties of government, is to make sure that every single person in this province feels that they are equally engaged and involved. And when I hear John Horgan talking about us and them, good and bad, friends and enemies, it's actually kind of sad to see a leadership figure like Mr. Horgan degrade himself by going to dividing communities rather than uniting them. I believe that everybody in British Columbia needs to be treated equally, respectfully, and that that's our duty in government. Mr. Horgan, to you. Well, thank you, uh, Sachi. And I uh, grew up in southern Vancouver Island. I was a lacrosse player. I played with uh, indigenous friends. I played with South Asian friends. For me, I did not see color. I, I felt that everyone around me was the same. And I brought that through my entire adult life, and I've instilled that in my children. And this generation and the generation after continues to see everyone equally. Gays, lesbians, people of color, regardless of who you are, people need to be included. I think it's a bit rich for Mr. Wilkinson to be talking about inclusion to me and, and casting aspersions on my character. What I've tried to focus on since I had the opportunity to represent people in my com community is to bring people together, to unite people, to recognize that we are all in this. Regardless of our background, regardless of our orientation, we all need each other to help out. I believe that what we need to do is tell the stories of our diversity. That's why we've established a Chinese Canadian Museum, so that the 150 years of participation in our culture Sir, and our society... Sir, with the 15 seconds left, this is a question about your own personal reflection. And I'm saying to you that we need to tell the stories about who we are as British Columbians. That's what I grew up learning, and that's what I want to do as the leader of the government. I think that's critically important that you lead by example based on what you believe. I haven't seen that from Mr. Wilkinson and, okay, in the past and that's, week. And that is time, Mr. Horgan. And we go to you, Ms. Furstenau. I'll repeat the question. Uh, how have you personally reckoned with your own privilege and an unconscious bias as a white political leader? I think the moment for me that really hit it home was imagining being a mother and saying to my child, if you're approached by a policeman, don't do anything, just put your hands up. I can't imagine being a mother and imagining that my child, my son, might die because of the color of his skin. We aren't all equal. I wish we were, but we're not. In this province, in this country, and around the world, people who are black, people who are of color, are still experiencing systemic 
and personal racism on a daily basis, the three of us cannot reckon what that's like because we are white. But we have to, in our roles, work to end that systemic racism and work to ensure that all mothers can let their children go out and not be worried that they're going to be killed. Thank you, Ms. Fristino. Now, back to you. Uh, per the draw on a specific question for each leader on social issues, your first question. Uh, the Greens have had trouble attracting candidates and voters who represent the diversity of BC. Why do you think this is? You have one minute. It's something we absolutely need to look at and work on, and it connects right to the question that you just asked. We're going to make better decisions as a province, we're going to make better decisions as legislators and decision makers when the people making the decisions bring all perspectives to the table. We have increased our diversity in this election campaign, despite it being a SNAP campaign, but we have a long way to go. And I'm committed to that. We need more people of color. We need more diversity. And, and we need to have that because it's how we're going to make better decisions. It is about perspective. When you haven't experienced how it is to be young or female or black or indigenous, and you're trying to make decisions that impact those communities, you cannot understand it fully. So we need those people, we need that diversity so that we're making decisions that reflect what needs to happen in this province. Thank you. Your follow-up question. You have one of the highest rates of First Nations youth in your Vancouver Island riding, youth who are in care. Uh, your MLA office has advocated for many young Indigenous mothers facing removal, apprehension of their babies by the provincial government. Why have you become so personally involved in these cases? We are still removing Indigenous children from their families at the same rate as during the uh, residential school era. And the mothers and the parents that we see in our office are devoted and loving. Most of the removals that happen in this province, over 70%, are because of a subjective idea of neglect, which really means poverty. We're removing children because of poverty from their parents, the trauma of that on a child, on an infant's brain, on the mother, on the community, is what we are replicating generation over generation. It's why we have so many of the problems we have right now. I cannot understand why either of the two parties feel the urgency, do not feel the urgency that I feel on addressing this issue. We need to stop this in Canada and in BC. Thank you, Ms. Fristino. Now to you, Mr. Wilkinson, your first question on this uh, theme. Longtime Liberal MLA Jane Thornthwaite apologized on the weekend for sexualized comments that she made about NDP MLA Bowen Ma. Ms. Ma is the youngest MLA in the BC Legislature. You were present when the comments were made. You did not object. You did not interject. The leader sets the tone for the team. Are you setting the right tone? You have one minute. That very unfortunate event was the subject of a lot of controversy this weekend, and I apologized on Sunday morning to Bowen Ma, the MLA involved, and Jane Thornthwaite has also apologized. I went out this morning in front of the media and also said that what happened was completely unacceptable, an exceptionally poor taste, and it was sexism with one female MLA commenting on another female MLA. We have to move into a new world where those kinds of things aren't acceptable. I didn't speak up at the time because it was a roast for an 87-year-old MLA who was retiring. But I think everyone on the call realized that it was totally inappropriate and it was really unacceptable. In retrospect, it would have been better if I went out on the call or immediately after the call and corrected the behavior of uh, Jane Thornthwaite. But we thought it's time to move forward. I've offered to speak directly with Bowen Ma, the MLA involved, and express my apologies to her directly for not intervening and stopping the comments of Ms. Sorenthwaite. Thank you. Your next question, Mr. Wilkinson. Last year you called life for renters in British Columbia wacky, fun, and part of growing up and getting better. This year you characterized victims of domestic violence as people who are in a tough marriage. Mr. Wilkinson, are you out of touch with struggling and vulnerable people? 
Well, I've had a life of struggling myself from coming to Canada as an immigrant with very little money, moving through the school system, delivering papers to earn any pocket money, paying my own way through university. So I like to think I have some insight into what it's like to be a renter since I did it for 18 years, going from one place to the next. I was referring to my own experience, which was messy. Moving 17 times in 18 years is very difficult. And on the issue of uh, domestic violence, this has to be one of our highest priorities in our society to make sure that women feel safe, that we have transition houses for them when necessary, that we're supporting their needs. And that's one of the reasons why we're supporting a very strong $10 a day daycare system for any family with an income less than $65,000 so that women, especially single women, can have guaranteed access to daycare so that they can get out in the workforce move ahead in their lives and have the autonomy that comes with having reliable daycare at an affordable price and the opportunity to be in the workforce. That's critical to who we are and thank where you, we need to thank go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. To you, Mr. Horgan, now your first question on this theme. Across BC, tent cities are becoming semi-permanent fixtures. What are you going to do to help people living in those tents and address the impacts on BC communities? You also have one minute. Thank you. We were the first government in Canada to put in place a standalone Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. We brought forward modular housing, thousands of units to help people get out of tents and into homes. I mentioned AJ earlier on as a beacon, an example of how you can transform someone's life who's riddled with addictions and has significant challenges by giving them a home and giving them the services that they need making sure that we have social workers, psychologists, and other healthcare professionals there for people to make that transition out of the tent, into a home, and back into the community. These are daunting challenges. They didn't happen overnight, and they won't be resolved overnight. But we need to make a commitment each and every day. That's why having someone at the cabinet table that is only focused on those issues makes a transformative difference in the lives of individuals. Is it a challenge? Yes, it is. We have much more work to do. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Your next question, 5,000 people have died since the opioid crisis was declared a public health emergency in 2016. Dr. Bonnie Henry has long called for nurses to be able to prescribe pharmaceuticals as an alternative to toxic street drugs. And yet, it took until this pandemic for you to adopt her recommendations. Why so long? We have been working with Dr. Henry and her advice on the pandemic has been, uh, pardon me, on, on the opioid crisis has been stellar. Uh, we have worked on uh, prescription alternatives to dirty street drugs. The, the pandemic has created a bigger problem. We had seen a decline in deaths from overdoses over time. They started to spike up again because of the pandemic. We had borders closed so the toxic street drugs got worse. That's why we accelerated prescription alternatives. Uh, Minister, Wil or Minister, Mr. Wilkinson made some useful suggestions this summer during debate. We're hoping to incorporate that if we get the, the, the blessing of the people of BC to form another government. These challenges are profound and we need to make sure that we're all working on it together. But it starts by making sure that all orders of government, federal, provincial and municipal, understand that these are our brothers, our sisters, our neighbours, our co-workers who are struggling with addictions. They need our help, not our contempt. We need to focus on lifting them up and giving them the tools they need to recover. That's why we've tripled treatment beds since we came to government, particularly for young people. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Now, leaders, it's your turn to debate on social issues. This round, we're making a little change. You will have 15 seconds for the question, 30 seconds for an uninterrupted answer, and then two minutes and 15 seconds for free debate. As per the draw, Mr. Wilkinson begins with a question to John Horgan. One of your cabinet ministers said recently that permanent tent cities are the right approach. Do you agree that having permanent tent cities is acceptable in Canada and especially in British Columbia, Mr. Horgan? I believe that the homelessness crisis grew by 30 percent between 2014 and 2017. It's been growing steadily about a 1 percent a year since then profound challenges that need our attention and our focus. I believe that we need to look at all of the options available to us. We've been moving people, we've been purchasing hotels, moving people into them, and making sure that they have services while they're there. These are disruptive uh, events in people's lives. It's not easy to find yourself without a home and without a house. We need to make sure we give them our compassion, not our contempt. 
Well, and that same cabinet minister referred to your rundown motels policy by saying you can't scoop people out of a park and put them in a rundown hotel and expect it to succeed. It's designed to fail. And yet that's what you persist in doing. We see it spilling onto the streets of Maple Ridge and Victoria and Vancouver, increasing street disorder, sadly increasing crime because the criminals are preying upon these people. I have said let's treat the causes and prevent the harm. And is there something in the way of treating people with schizophrenia? you treat them with a tent or a rundown motel. Why aren't we treating these mental illnesses? Brain injuries don't get treated with a tent or a rundown motel. So Mr. Horgan, I'd challenge you by saying that your policy has been a colossal failure and it's causing street disorder in towns all over British Columbia that nobody sees any end to until we have an implemented program like I've talked about of getting psychiatric nurses working with the police and increasing the number of police officers to fill the 200 vacancies that you left Mr. so Wilson. that we now have crime rates rapidly rising in Vancouver, Ms. Maple Mr. Ridge, Mr. Wilkinson, Victoria. let him respond. I'm curious, Andrew, that as if this just started a, a couple of weeks ago for you, this has been a challenge in British Columbia for decades. The downtown east side is infamous around North America. We've been working diligently, as I suspect you were as well, to address these issues. We're looking at using the Riverview lands because the people of Coquitlam say we want this to be a haven, a, a, a sanctuary for people struggling with mental health, addictions, and other issues. That's how you create solutions, working with communities. Other communities like Vancouver and Victoria are looking at solutions that meet their needs. The province's responsibility is to make sure the resources are there for those communities and those people. We need to build up a system that was torn down over many decades, not over many weeks. And these things need to be judged by their results. And we see the results on the streets of Kelowna, the streets of Kamloops, the streets of Vancouver and Victoria. It's not working, Mr. Horgan. So when well, do you stop say, say to the, say when do you AJ. stop pursuing a dead end? When yes. do you stop hitting your head against the wall yes. and do something constructive to treat the causes to prevent the harm? You need You've to help got people to take you don't some responsibility. Mr. To Let Mr. Horgan respond. You, you don't have solutions, Andrew. If you had them, you would have implemented them in the 16 years that you had. The problem got worse, not better on your watch. I think it's rich for you to throw this back at Sonia and I, who for the past three, well, to me, for the past three and a half years, we've been working together to solve these challenges. All right, that's time for this segment. Now, Mr. Horgan, with a question to Ms. Verstenau. Yes, well, I, Sonia, I want to ask you about the challenges of uh, accessing health care services in British Columbia. We've been building hospitals. We've been putting in place urgent primary care centers. We're going to hire another 7,000 workers to go into home care and long-term care. What solutions does the Green Party have to address the challenges of finding health care in British Columbia? It's an absolutely essential question to be asking, particularly in a time like this, when we recognize how important the health and well-being of people are in this province. We support the move towards more primary, primary health care, as well as ensuring that every community has family doctors. Every person in this province should have that family care. We've also uh, suggested in our platform that we incorporate mental health care as part of primary health care so that people can access mental health care without having the barrier of it being unaffordable. You have Thank time you. to debate, sir. Yeah. Well, and, and as the, the questions have demonstrated tonight, we come back to health care all the time here in British Columbia and in Canada because it separates us from our neighbours to the south. Public health care is fundamental to who we are as Canadians. And we need to make sure we're training enough people. Your platform talks about it. Our platform talks about a new medical centre in Surrey to train doctors, nurse practitioners and other health care providers to make up for the deficit that built over the 16 years the BC Liberals were on the watch. It was we your need deficit to, in doctors. We, we need to make sure that we're not bringing back medical services premiums for these delivery of free services that are part of our citizenship. And I'm glad that we agree on this, Sonia. I'm, I'm comforted that we can continue to go forward over the next number of years to make sure that British Columbians get the services they deserve. Well, I'm, I'm glad we agree on it and we agree on many things. We don't agree on everything. But what we had was something unprecedented in BC for a very long time, which was parties working across party lines. I would point to the health regulation reforms mm -hmm. uh, brought forward by Adrian Dix, myself and Norm Letnick, a fantastic example of what can be achieved when we work across all three party lines to put the public health, public trust and public safety at the center of the work we do and p not have partisanship and politicization in it. We should have been doing more of that. We had another year to continue doing that and we could have been bringing forward all manner of excellent programs and services for British Columbians. 
The challenges are not for the next few months, but for the next few years. And I believe that we need to put the politics behind us. You're absolutely right. I think we all agree on that. But I think people at home have seen tonight that there are profound differences between the three of us and our approach to British Columbians and how we want to make sure they're safe through this pandemic and that they can grow and prosper in the future. Having choices is what elections are about. Asking people what they think is never a bad idea. I'm glad we're here tonight talking about these important issues, and I think British Columbians are as well. No, oh, I think British Columbians want to know that once we're elected, we put aside our partisanship and we be the people that they elect us to be, which is putting our service to them first. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Furstenow, you have a question to Mr. Horgan. Thank you, John. When you called the election, it ended the review of the Police Act, which was looking at systemic racism. Do you think your government has done enough to address systemic racism in British Columbia? I agree. Systemic racism is a critical problem in British Columbia and indeed across Canada and in fact North America. What we've seen in the United States is a wake up call for all of us and I think we've heard tonight that all of us agree that we have a responsibility as white leaders to make sure we're doing what we can to reduce systemic racism. That's why we put in place an all party committee. It will be revived. I'm confident regardless of the outcome of the election. I think all of us agree on that. That's how we make make change in people's lives by putting it on the table, having the discussion, and then making the changes people need. I think it's interesting you were approached by the black community to pass as a province the UN Declaration on the Decade of People of African Descent in 2017, and there was no progress made on that. Having made that declaration, had you passed that as a province, it would have actually brought uh, services, funding, and benefits to the black community in BC. I also look to the impacts that so many government policies have on indigenous communities in this province, and the lack of urgency to recognize the systemic racism that exists in the relationship between the provincial government and indigenous people in this province. We passed UNDRIP, and yet in the first session that we had after that, we did not see your government apply the lens that it was supposed to be applied with that piece of legislation. And we heard from First Nations and indigenous people that they were not treated as equals in government to government that, relationships. That, that is not correct, Sonia. We agreed, all of us, to put in place a work plan, and that work is underway, has been underway, and will continue. A little thing called the global pandemic happened along the way, but despite that, officials in the government continue to work with the First Nations Leadership Council and other groups across British Columbia to make sure that the work that we all did together would be implemented and solidified, not just for a short period of time, but for the rest of time in British Columbia. That's what Indigenous peoples deserve, and I thought that's what we were all working on. I'm confident that there will be stumbles along the way. This is not perfect. Uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said quite famously, reconciliation isn't for wimps. So we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to disagree. But the fact of the matter is we now have a table and a framework to work under. I'm very proud of that and I know you are too. I'm proud of the legislation being passed and it was something that my colleague Adam Olson put an enormous amount of effort and energy into ensuring that it was brought forward. But the work plan isn't sufficient right now and the urgency to address systemic racism both for Indigenous people and the black community in this province, uh, it doesn't seem to exist within your government. I just disagree with you, Sonia. We've been working on this from day one. Uh, Ravi Kalan did a profound amount of work on anti-racism. He's passed that on to Ann Kang and we're going to continue that work for as long as we possibly can. And that is time. That's it for that portion of the debate. And leaders, our time is almost up. So thank you. And let's get to closing statements. With the order by draw, Ms. First to know, you will make the first closing statement, then you, Mr. Wilkinson, and you, Mr. Horgan, after that. Each of you have a minute and a half. Ms. First to know to you. Thank you, Shachi, and thank you for this evening. I, it's been uh, an enlightening debate. I hope that the people watching at home have found it to be informative and helpful in making their decision. I know that we're in a really hard time. All of you are facing pressures and challenges that could not have been imagined before this year. We've never lived through a global pandemic before. We've never had to face the experience of wondering if businesses are going to make it through the winter, if our small tourism operators who have built their families and their lives ensuring that we have somewhere to recreate in this province are going to make it. We have teachers who are worried about the conditions that they're teaching and we have parents worried about their children and their safety in school. And we have long-term worries, are we going to be able to pay our rent, our mortgages? 
What does the future look like? And then overlapping all of that is a climate emergency that we're in that government over government over government has ignored the evidence, ignored the warnings and gotten us to this place. We've had for three and a half years an unprecedented level of cooperation in the BC legislature. It serves people well. The best thing in this election is not to hand power to any single party, but to ensure that we have the kind of collaboration and cooperation that puts the people and their needs first. And to achieve that, vote green. Thank you, Ms. First to know. To you, Mr. Wilkinson. Thank you for having us, Sachi, and thank you for the people for watching. Families across British Columbia are really worried about financial ruin in the next year. We need to pull together. We need to work together to put BC back in gear. In the spring, I said in March, it was time for us to fight the virus, not to fight each other. And that worked in a trusting relationship for a while until John Horgan broke that trust. He decided to look out for himself by calling this totally unnecessary election when he and the Greens had another year in their working arrangement. You have to decide whether you can trust John Horgan when he's doing this purely for his own interests. But when we get through this, when we get through this election, I'm hoping all of us can think about rebuilding BC. It's going to take effective, competent leadership to build British Columbia up again, to make it a place we're all proud of. We know that this can be the greatest place on earth, but we're all going to have to pull together. We're all going to have to make British Columbia our priority. We're going to have to invest in ourselves, in our families, in our kids, in our communities. Because we will beat this virus. We will do it because we're really good at what we do. And after that, we're going to have to build ourselves up to make this the very best place in the whole wide world to grow up and have a family. You'll need to decide who you want to lead this recovery from the pandemic. And I do hope you'll choose the BC Liberal team. My name's Andrew Wilkinson, and I'm hoping for your support whenever you decide to vote in the next 11 days. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. To you, Mr. Horgan, for the closing statement. Thank you, Shachi, and I want to thank everyone at home for staying with us for the past hour and a half, and I want to thank my colleagues for a very civil debate about the issues that matter to British Columbians. No one thought in March that we would find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. There was no plan in place other than emergency preparedness activities that kicked in right away, and in BC, we're doing the right thing. We're working, following the guidance of Dr. Bonnie Henry to make sure that everyone can be safe. And we've learned over the past number of months that even though we can't be together, we can still be there for each other. This election is not about the next few months, but about the next few years. And the question is quite clear. Who do you want to lead you and where do you want to go? I believe that Mr. Wilkinson's plan is focused on making sure that there are rich get the biggest benefits with $3 billion in tax breaks that you'll pay for with cuts to services that your family depend upon. I believe the job of Premier is to work for you. I believe that we pl have a plan in place that will do just that, that will make sure that we get out of this pandemic together, that we keep your loved ones safe, healthy and secure. The plan will work because it's focused on you and investing in education, child care, investing in health care, seniors care, all across the province. And also, to make affordability a little bit better, a $1,000 COVID benefit so you can get by the next number of months. The climate leading plan that makes North America uh, envy what we've been able to accomplish here in British Columbia. On the 24th of October, I hope you'll support the NDP candidate in your community. Thank you very much for the evening. Leaders, thank you. Thank you for a respectful debate. Y'all get a cookie. <laughs> nice work. Uh, we're going to come back in a moment, but before we leave you, do stay with us. Those of you at home, we have a quick word now on how to vote in a pandemic. This is an unprecedented election. It's estimated almost half of BC's 2 million voters plan to do so by mail. If you haven't requested your vote by mail package yet, please do so as soon as possible because your ballot must be received by 8 p.m. on October 24th to be counted. The recommended deadline to mail your vote is October 17th, but if you are going to vote by mail after that, you can drop your ballot off at advanced polling stations, district electoral offices, or service BC locations. Please check the Elections BC website for details. 
If you plan to vote in person, advance polls are open October 15th to the 21st. Check your voting card or elections.bc.ca for the polling station closest to you. COVID-19 safety protocols are in place at all polling stations. These include physical distancing, capacity limits based on the size of the location, elections officials wearing PPE, hand sanitizing stations, and frequent cleaning of those voting stations. So vote by mail as soon as possible, or vote in advance polls, or vote in person. But above all, make sure you vote. And that is it for tonight, British Columbia, and for those of you watching in points beyond, we do hope that this debate has helped you get to know the leaders, the parties, the platforms, and again, we thank the leaders for a respectful debate tonight. We especially hope that it has served you well in deciding how to vote. Thank you. I'm Shachi Curl. On behalf of my colleagues in the BC Broadcasting Consortium, good night.